Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to chapel at Columbia Theological Seminary. Uh, we are so grateful that you're gathered right here or joining us online. Today, we are also grateful to welcome Jay Horton to chapel. Jay is the communications manager at Georgia Interfaith Power and Light, also known as GIPL. So if you hear that, that's what that means. <laughs> GIPL's mission is to inspire and equip communities of faith to organize, implement practical climate solutions, and advocate across Georgia on issues of climate change, environmental justice, and community resilience. For more information, be sure to grab a flyer from the welcome table. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to set the stage for Care for Creation Week. Um, so we're grateful to Jay. I uh, wanna say a little bit more about Jay. He's a graduate of both UGA with a bachelor's degree in journalism and a master's of divinity from our friends over at Candler School of Theology. Um, Jay and his husband Robert live here in Atlanta and are proud dads to a very sweet three-year-old dog with a great name, I think, Magnolia June. <laughs> Jay, we're really grateful that you're with us today. Um, on Thursday, we, uh, we'll have chapel in here at 1010 for Come See Columbia Day, so come and worship with us and some folks who are checking us out and thinking about um, spending some quality time with us here in the future. Um, and then on Friday, we will join together for another uh, service to really honor Care for Creation and um, hear from our, the winner of the Care for Creation Sermon Award, Courtney Ann Henry. Pay attention to your email because all details about that service, accessibility, and all other things will be coming your way tomorrow. Um, and with that, we are uh, ready to worship God. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Thank you. Friends, please sit or stand as the Spirit leads for our call to worship this morning. We walk in wonder beneath the sun and stars. Creation is God's masterpiece, and we are blessed to share it. We give thanks for the air, the land, and the water. Beauty is before. 
for us, around us, over us, and beneath us. We join our hearts, minds, and spirits as one in thanks and awe. Thank you. You may be seated. Friends, the word says where two or more gather in my name, I am there with them. Let us enter into a moment of prayer. Divine creator, through our worship of you this morning, may we find our hearts and minds united with your creating spirit. Help us to be worthy of the gift of life you share with us. Inspire us in this day together that we may care more deeply for your good earth and its inhabitants. Amen. Amen.
Beloved, we are made in the divine image, and God called us good. Yet we go our own way, causing harm to ourselves, to one another, and to the planet. Confident in the mercy of the one who made us and saved us, let us confess our sin to God and to one another. Please pray with me. God of life, you created us in your image to care for one another and for all creation. Forgive us for turning away from you, ignoring the needs of our neighbors and the cries of the earth. As the sun brings light and warmth to this earth, make us signs of your grace. Through Christ, our light and life, we pray. Amen. In the waters of baptism, God pours out mercy and blessing. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace as you share that blessing with others in care for this good earth that all creation may declare God's glory. Friends, brothers, sisters, our scripture today, the first one, comes from the book of John. Is there a second one? <laughs> I'm sorry. Our first scripture today comes from the book of John, verses 6, book 6, verses 1 to 15. Pray with me. Gracious God, your word is a living word. By your spirit, awaken us that we may see and hear your presence in the world. And in the scripture we read today, we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our sibling and guide. Amen. After this, Jesus went across the Galilee Sea that is the Tiberias Sea. A large cloud followed him because they had seen the miraculous signs Jesus had done among the sick. Jesus went up a mountain and sat there with his disciples. It was nearly time for Passover, the Jewish festival. Jesus looked up and saw the large crowd coming toward him. Then Jesus asked Philip, hey, where are we gonna get the food for all these people? Jesus said this to test Philip, for Jesus already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, more than half a year's salary worth of food wouldn't be enough for each person to have even a little bit. One of Jesus' other disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said, A youth here has five barley, lo barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that for a crowd like this? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass there. They sat down, about 5,000 of them. Then Jesus took the bread. When he had given thanks, he distributed to those who were sitting there. Jesus did the same with the fish, each getting as much as they wanted. When they had plenty to eat, Jesus said to his disciples, gather up the leftover pieces so that nothing will be wasted. So the disciples gathered the leftover pieces and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of leftover from the five barley loaves that had been left over by those who had eaten. When the people saw that Jesus had done a miraculous sight, sorry, a miraculous sign, they said, 
This is truly the prophet who is coming into the world. Jesus understood that they were about to come to him and force him to be their king. So he took refuge again, alone, on the mountain. The word of God for the people of God. Friends, let us pray. Lord, here we are to worship. Here we are to bow down. Here we are to say you are indeed our holy and our worthy God. Hide this, your servant, behind that old rugged cross, so that everything that is said and everything that is heard comes straight from you. O most beloved God. Amen. Good morning, friends. It's good to be with you all today um, in the house of the Lord on this Earth Month, um, Earth Week, coming up on Earth Day. Um, it, almost, it also happens to be the same time of year as our scripture for the day. Did you know that? Nearly time for Passover. Passover in the Jewish tradition commemorates the story of the Exodus, of the Israelites' liberation from Egypt. The time is typically marked by a Seder meal, plates full of symbolic food like matzah, unleavened bread representing the bread that did not have time to rise when the Jews fled Pharaoh, and bitter herbs reminiscent of the sour taste of slavery. There are traditional retellings of the freedom story and a singing of everyone's favorite song, Dayenu. Die, die, enu, die, die, enu, Die, die, anu, die, anu, die, anu. Uh, the chorus translates to, it would have been enough. Die, anu. Did you know that? It's a song of gratitude, of praise for all the amazing things God has done. Verses talk about how any one of the things God did for God's people providing the scriptures, the Sabbath, the way out of Egypt, any one of them would have been enough. But God gave it all, and we are so grateful. I do not think it's a coincidence that the miracle we read about in today's gospel lesson is happening just before this of all Jewish festivals, the Passover, celebrating Thanksgiving and having more than enough. Jesus had picked up a large following around the Sea of Galilee. The crowds had seen and heard all about the miracles he was performing, among them healing the sick. He goes up on a mountain and becomes dinner time, and Jesus asks one of his disciples, Philip, where will we buy enough food to feed all these people? He does this, the scripture says, to, to see if his pupil is learning anything. I mean, I've, there's some teachers in the room. I'm sure they are aware of how this, how this goes. Philip, deeply concerned, go, goes more than half a year's worth of salary would not be enough food, would not provide enough food for each person to have even a little bit. And I imagine in his head, he's thinking like a lot of seminarians, and he's, he's going, but you called me from my job a couple <laughs> passages ago. Andrew adds, well, there's this youth over here with five barley loaves and two fish, but what good is that for a crowd like this? <laughs> Jesus says, hold my beer. No, not, that's not exactly what he says. <laughs> but he does tell the disciples very firmly to have the crowd sit on the plentiful grass. Sit down together in the same place. He takes the bread and the fish, and what does he do? He, he gives thanks. He gives thanks, and then he passes the plate along. He does the same with the fish. He gives thanks, and he passes the plate along. The scripture says, when they had had plenty to eat, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftover pieces so nothing is wasted. Nothing is wasted in the kingdom of God. They did, as Jesus said, and they filled 12 whole baskets with the leftovers. People were so amazed by the generosity and how far the food went 
they called Jesus a prophet. And it says they wanted to make him a king. If you've heard preachers speak on this passage before, or the similar passages in the other Gospels, they may have leaned into the magical, otherworldly, only God-like power that made such a small amount of resources reach so many people. However, one, nowhere in the scripture does it say that there was ever more than what the youth gave, five barley loaves and two fish. Even when they gathered up the leftovers, it's leftovers from five barley loaves, no more. And secondly, Jesus does not like that the crowd wants to make him their king. It's like they miss the point or something, and he runs off away to be alone. This was not a miracle of some divine magic, the scripture seems to say, but one of holy, inspirational generosity. Don't you get it? Everyone was fed, not because of some uniquely divine power that only I have, but because everyone showed gratitude for what was had, and everyone passed the plate. This was the divine lesson that I believe Christ taught then, and Christ is teaching us now. This is not something that only he can make happen, but something all of us can do now. Facts tell us our resources are pretty finite, yes. There's only a certain amount of food, water, housing, money, natural resources, you name it, to go around. But it doesn't always feel like it's going around, does it? We watch the news and hear of drought and famine sending thousands to starvation. We read stories of housing shortages and growing wealth gaps. We're told that there is a need for more fossil fuel production to keep up with growing economies in Georgia and beyond. There's just not enough. Or is there? Enough is a relatively subjective term, isn't it? It measures perception, not reality, and therefore can be changed. What if I told you that according to the Committee on World Food Security, we produce enough food globally to feed 1.5 times the current population? We have enough food to feed 10 billion people in a current population of just over 7 billion people. The problem is distribution, (laughs) not quantity. And what if I told you that according to a recently published article in CNN, U.S. housing shortages and housing affordability issues could be solved if we were more comfortable with and invested in more multifamily and multi-generational housing. Researchers in Australia have also found that by housing more family members under one roof, multi-generational family living presents unheralded opportunities to save water, energy, building materials, and land. And what if I told you that new energy demand here in Georgia and across the country could be met by renewable sources, or would even slow and begin to reverse the effects of climate change? The Southern Environmental Law Center, the SCLC, projects that Georgia Power's new energy demand can be met with renewable energy options like solar and battery storage here in Georgia. Enough is about perception, and perception can be changed, you see. And an easy way to do that is what Jesus said, to give thanks. The disciples like us perceived deficiency, shortage, and lack based on a greedy understanding of what was necessary and satisfying. But Christ showed them that, there, that when we are grateful for what we are given, that can become enough, more than enough even. It does not necessarily physically increase our resources, but it makes us look at our resources differently. Less disposable or expendable, no waste. Working at Georgia Interfaith Power and Light Gipple, I work with a lot of different people from all different walks of life. And I find that the more grateful people are, the more likely they are to be the ones that reuse or compost or recycle. Nothing goes to waste, it seems, for the one with a grateful heart, because it's precious. It's a blessing. As we're in this Earth Month, consider composting or the ways you dispose of materials. 
you could toss it out, or you could take it to the Center for Hard to Recycle Materials, CHARM. You could throw something in a local landfill or use it to fertilize next year's produce and then bless a neighbor with cabbages and cucumbers and tomatoes. I must confess, as I was writing the sermon for today, I was listening to Beyonce's new album, Cowboy Carter, playing in the background. <laughs> and I couldn't help but think of Dolly Parton, queen of country herself, and her song, Code of Many Colors. Have you heard it? I recall a box of rags that someone gave us, Dolly sings, and how my mama put those rags to use. My coat of many colors, I wore it so proudly. Although we had no money, I was rich as I could be. My coat of many colors, my mama made for me. Dolly's gratitude for this coat of old rags made by her loving mother made that coat worth more than all her friends' clothes. As in our gospel lesson, they only had a little, but a little went a long way with some thanksgiving. Now you all know the story. Gratitude is where Christ begins, but it's certainly not where he finishes. When he had given thanks, he distributed the bread and the fish to those who were sitting there, the gospel says. He gave thanks, and then he passes the plate. When we realize what we have received is more than enough for us, we are more likely to share the rest. Someone gave those box of rags to Dolly's mom, did they not? A great example of this are churches like Druid Hills Presbyterian Church here in Atlanta, who have taken the initiative to loan out their spaces, they're only using less than half the time, to ministry partners who can do more good the rest of the week. It only seems fitting especially when those ministry partners reach people who may never take step foot in that church otherwise. In her book, Loaves and Fishes, the inspiring story of the Catholic worker movement, Dorothy Day describes how when she was trying to feed people during the Depression in these soup, kitchen, soup kitchens full of diversity and, she admits, animosity, Japanese and Chinese seated next to German and Italians, she often wondered if the bread would go around. She writes, how many times have I noticed one heaps his plate and the last one served has a little? How one wastes his food, so depriving his brother. But the miracle is, seldom do more people come in than we can feed. The bread does go around because people do pass the plate. So this Earth Month, on the eve of Passover, let us think about the ways we will feed, house, clothe, and provide for the multitudes in our lives. Not as an outcome of some happenstance miracle that only God can perform, but a lesson taken from Christ himself to be grateful and pass the plate, even when the person next to you is different, even when you disagree with the person next to you, even when you flat out despise the person next to you, pass the plate. The we resources we have right now, die, die, Amy, they would be enough, sufficient, if we rethought our consumption habits our disposal habits, if we shared more, if we voted with our planet and our neighbors in mind, we too can learn what the disciples learned way back when. Enough is enough to go around when we give thanks and we pass the plate. In the name of the Creator and the Christ and the Holy Spirit, amen. Friends, as we take in the words that we just heard, I invite you to center yourselves for a time of prayer. Let us pray. God of the universe, you made the heavens and the earth so that we do not call our home merely planet Earth. 
We call it your creation, a divine mystery, a gift from your most blessed hand. The world itself is your miracle. Bread and vegetables from earth are thus also from heaven. Help us to see in our daily bread your presence. Upon this land and upon our lives, may your stars rain down their blessed dust. May you send rain and sunshine upon our garden and us. Grant us humility to touch the soil so that we might become more human, that we might mend our rift from your creation, that we might then know the sacredness of the gift of life that we might truly experience life from the hand of God, for you planted humanity in a garden and began our resurrection in a garden. Our blessed memory and hope lie in a garden. Thanks be to God who made the world teeming with variety of things on the earth, above the earth, under the earth. Thanks be to God for the many kinds of plants, trees, and fruits we celebrate. For the centipedes, ants, and worms, for the mice, marmots, and bats, for the cucumbers, tomatoes, and peppers. We rejoice that we find ourselves eclipsed by the magnitude of generosity and mystery. Thanks be to God. Amen.